So today we've got um, Lee Munro joining us, MC, rapper, vocalist, podcast host. Yeah. Father. Being all around, good, all around good guy. All yeah. around top bloke. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up. Um, yeah, so we get, we've got Lee in today to have a bit of a chat about uh, music and his journey. Um, so yeah, we'll get into it. Mm. Um, so... When did you start rapping and, and like, what was the motivation that made you sort of pick up the pen and start getting into it? Um, I started probably doing it myself, you know, even when I was young. Uh, I always loved it, you know what I mean, coming up. Um, it was, it was um, you know, Fresh Prince was out, um, you know, Bell Biv DeVoe. There was a lot of tracks, you know, with, with, with raps in them and stuff. And then you just go along with the, with the music, you know what I mean? When I first started actually writing, that was probably about uh, 14. Um, it was pretty horrible stuff, um, you know, but, um, but yeah, so I first started um, around, around 14. The, the thing was why I started writing was, yeah, I don't know, really. Like I feel like um, once I started to get into high school and I went to school in Bankstown, um, and I mean, you, you sort of know the areas around back in the day as well yourself, you know, um, we, we sort of grew up in a little bit of an, uh, an era there together as well when we we're playing ball together and stuff. But, um, you know, um, a lot of the, uh, I think, topics and content in the, in the hip hop and the rap was really, uh, you know, relevant to a lot of things that were going on around us. You know what I mean? At the time, yeah. um, when I started to getting getting into a, a little bit more of the, you know, um, you know, the biggies and the two parks and and that sort of era, um, you know, I mean, other than the, you know, the party sort of big lifestyle, you know, a lot of the other stuff that they talked about, you know, you, I wasn't necessarily directly involved in, you know, I was never like a drug dealer or, or a real like, you know, gang banger or anything. But I, like I knew, and I still do to this day, know a lot of guys that were, you know, got yeah. in, got on the wrong side of it, and and they're just they're just you know normal good dudes. So I suppose that that dialogue was really um, probably the most um, relatable, um, you know, because yeah, it was around us. It's not like you necessarily even had to be in it per se, like both feed in, but it was happening around you, and that was your experience. Like that's what we were experiencing at that time. Yeah, it's. It's really funny as well because you know, and I'm sure that you've had this as well, man. Like um, at the time and for a long time after, you know, it wasn't something that I think that mainstream Australian media really wanted to sort of admit that mm. that there was a massive problem sort of going on. It was, you know, a little bit, you know, out there, and and maybe it was more out there than I thought, you know. But um, because I wasn't really paying attention to much media um, simultaneously, you know, but. Yeah it did feel like we were a bit of a forgotten pocket as far as, you know, demographic went. And it was a, you know, um, absolute mix of races and, you know, cultural differences and, and stuff like that, you know, drugs were pretty heavy. Um, and I think it was heroin at the time, you know, sort of liver cabramatta ways. Um, so anyway, I, I started to relate to that and, and then I sort of wanted to write, you know, my version of it. So, you know, I started sort of emulating it and a lot of it was, um, Initially, I started with like performing covers and stuff like that, and and doing R and B tracks with raps on it and whatever we could do. Um, and then, uh, and then like Wu Tang would come out, and then that just really sort of changed the whole way we would say things. You know, like there was a lot more thought behind the writing process. You know, you'd be writing stuff with maybe a little bit of a you know metaphor or you know a little bit more slang. Um, so. Um, so yeah, man. I think it was just a lifestyle thing, you know. Um, and um, and yeah, just developed over the years. So yeah. Cool. And did anyone sort of help you get started? Was there anyone sort of locally that that once you sort of started taking it a bit more seriously, kind of you know gave you a leg up or sort of mentored you or or, or gave you sort of any help in any way? That's a really good question. You know, no one's really asked me that 
And I, I got to sort of think about it, to be honest, because I remember the first sort of real recording that I ever did was at school. And that was because at school it was, I, I did music and I was able to get my hands on some microphones and some, you know, um, drum machines and stuff like that and just do some really basic stuff. Um, you know, but outside of that, um, the there really wasn't. I had to do a lot of, as an MC, getting around, getting on microphones, doing open nights, uh, open mic nights, um, you know, they sometimes at the club they do like talent shows, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And it was really um, the first, I think, I will say two things. So the first one was, um, I don't know if you remember Crush back in the day, the massive, massive yeah. under 18. Anyway, so um, I remember being there and I just jumped on an open mic and the DJ heard me. And, and he was, and uh, it was one of those um, competitions where it was like, all right, cool. Like we've got a prize. We'll do an open mic, Every, like a couple of MCs, spit a few bars and whatever. Everyone else is just like, you know, whatever freestyle and talking a bunch of crap. But I had all these written raps. So I jumped up and obviously my stuff sounded more structured and thought out, you know. So um, it, they were like, the DJ was like, oh, this is hectic. So he actually helped me out a bit, um, DJ Hamish. Um uh, he was more about from the live aspect. He ended up getting me as the as the um, as the MC down at Crush, and I was MCing down there. I was young. I was getting paid. You know, it was it was it was crazy. Uh, I couldn't believe it at the time. You know, thought, wow, man, like you can get some money from this. This is crazy. Yeah. You know? um, so I was doing that, um, and he really sort of put me in touch with uh, you know a couple of people on, and and namely DJs and promoters. But then on the on the other side, the recording side, um, I had gone down and done a show at a, a at a uh, at a club. I think it was like Chocolate City down on Oxford Street at the time, and um, we performed. And uh, DJ Nino Brown was actually um, DJing on that night, and he saw me the next day at Anthem Records, which was the which was the record spot in the city back in the day. And uh, he came up to me, he's like, "Oh, you were you that kid um, last night rapping?" And I was like, um, "Oh yeah, you know." Um, it was and he goes here's my business card and um he's like hit me up and bro at the time dj nino brown was yeah. like one of the like and still is one of the premier djs you know like he was like everyone knew who he was so i was a bit like holy crap like this crazy dj hit me up you know what i mean so i hit him up and um sorry to interrupt but that would have been around the time he had them sort of cds coming out and he had like the mixtape kind of yeah. albums yeah coming out and stuff yeah yeah yep this was before the whole life there was a massive licensing issue in in sydney for the djs but yeah he had um he had a, a few mixtapes out um not as not as big as the other the other guys that sort of got done for it but he had a few mixtapes out they were slinging those so um so so yeah he he had a name people had his cds and cds were were a thing back then you know yeah, yeah. so <laughs> Um, so yeah, I ended up recording my first ever demo over Jizzer Breaker Breaker instrumental over four yeah. track over, you know, over in, um, I think he was at his folks house in Lane Cove. Like it's crazy, bro. Like, you know? And so I thought like starting to get on my way as I went on, um, in those early days, man, it was, um, I didn't really, again, have a lot of help. It was more like the, the homies like sort of would have a, a spot that you'd go to and then they'd have like a relatively you know they might have the mpc there and you know they just four four track stuff you know what i mean um so or, or eight track stuff so yeah it, it was wasn't until a little later on that i came across like an opportunity with a uh what do you call it with a, like a manager sort of so to speak you know right. so it's pretty crazy a lot of leg work done you know yeah cool um and was it a case like when you were sort of going back and, and first starting out when you were sort of learning, was it was it a case of just listening to tracks and sort of, you know, taking bits here and there? Or were there any other sort of resources that you kind of use? Like we we obviously didn't have the internet back then to sort of look stuff up and, and, and stuff like that. But, yeah, besides listening, was there anything else like resource-wise or books or did you, you know, did you use a dictionary or, or anything like that or? No, nah, but I'll tell you one thing that I did do that was, when I think about it, was probably pretty important as far as like mastering a craft. I would go online and I would print off lyrics of tracks that I really liked flow-wise, you know, like I just, you know, and and I would rehearse, like I would learn the lyrics off by art 
and I and I just I just rap with the with you know with the track you know, um, and, and I'd really try to perfect the um, you know the the delivery of it the the you know the attitude the you know the I, I just try to get get everything down pat you know even almost like mimicking voices even to a, to a point where I do it for like ODB or something crazy you know what I mean like yeah so you know um that they were really the only resources to be at that time to be honest you know as far as like you know there was more resources i felt for like it was still a pretty early days for rap you know so there was like a lot of like i had a lot of mates you know that were more in in bands and you know they they'd be able to grab the instruments a little quicker you know what i mean like rehearsal rooms were a little bit more of a of a thing you know my next door neighbor was in a local band who who um who actually um won the um same competition that uh silver chair won remember this battle of the bands for the schools or something yeah yeah was what was the name of that band was that gildamesh no no it was me neither me neither yep 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 yeah yeah and had that track frog in a sock i don't know if you remember that yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) yeah so me neither um the um Dave, I think, was the drummer. He lived next door, um, and and it was dope, you know. Like it was, but still, resources for for MCs were were pretty pretty next to nothing, you know. So you just had to be really resourceful, you know, online. Or the biggest one was, you know, the CD stores. I used to go to Soul City over at Bankstown, uh, which yep. was like an offshoot of Soul Sense. Yeah, you remember? Yep. Just around the corner from Card Shack. And that's another. Yeah, that's yeah, another- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so i used to go there man and i used to work my casual job um uh, at ronnie's over at bass hill and yep. then i'd um ha- i'd make about 120 bucks a week right which was not too bad only problem was was import cds were 30 bucks to pop right yep. so i'd hit up soul sense with my 120 bucks man and i'd i'd cop two to three cds a week um and i'd cop you know, back then you'd have to, or, or you would do, you'd have to go and check reviews in the back of Source magazine or, yeah. or something like that to see if it was any good. Check out what you look, you know, keep an eye out for. Um, other than that, you'd have to, you know, open the CD case, you know, like look in there, see who produced things, see who's yeah. involved, see if you're recognizing names or like, you know, or instrumentalists or producers and and taking a punt, you know, like if you saw a few people like MCs and stuff, yeah, you might not know the guy whose who's CD it is, but... But like it might have a feature from Red Man or Method Man, so then you're like, well, you put two and two together, might, might be good. So you just yeah, you buy it, you know. It might be a piece of crap. <laughs> That's it, and th- and that was kind of the the thing back then, isn't it? You had to sort of commit that thirty bucks to something, to twelve songs or, or whatever you got on that deal, yep. and like you took that risk, and and you know, word of mouth was big, obviously. So if someone yep. recommended your shit, you would be like checking it out. But it was that commitment, and and then often you would play that disc to death because you spent thirty bucks on it. So you want to get as much value out of that thing as you can. So you're listening to every track on that album, you know. And I think that's lost a little bit these days. And and, and that was kind of my motivation for the question. Is I feel that's lost a little bit, or with all these sort of other resources, there's books on rapping, there's you know the. Uh, the rhyme dictionaries and stuff online and that, but I feel like a lot of young MCs I I come across, they don't really do that. They don't get the lyrics to a song and learn it from start to finish and and how to perform it, like the CD, like like you know I you, as you know I come up playing guitar and and in punk rock stuff, and that's a bit more of that approach of you're learning other people's songs to kind of learn the techniques to paint. I always say it's like learning, you're gaining new colours to paint with. So Bro, the more skills you learn and the more techniques and little bits, it's it, the better the picture you can paint. And I feel like that's lost a little bit these days with young guys coming up. They kind of, they don't really, yeah, commit to learning covers and, and, and sort of doing that process to really you know, gain all these little skills and little techniques and stuff. So, Bro, uh, you know, I, I, just to back that point up and and I totally agree because you know like I do understand the element of hip hop where it's like you know you've got to be your own person and you've Definitely. got to you know you've got to um you know carve your own lane and it's whack to emulate someone else or to copy someone else's style you know that that's a big thing in hip hop right it's, it's an integrity piece however and I recommend this to anyone um actually funnily enough but one of the best um bo- um autobiographies I ever read was Eric Clapton's one right 
And and the thing that blew me away and a massive thing I got from that was was that, you know, in his early days when people were literally, you know, spray painting Clapton is God on, on you know, walls and stuff like that, you know, he was still, you know, catching the train home from gigs, um, you know, sometimes sleeping in parks. Um, and he he still felt like quite a bit of a fraud because he was like this UK guy that had just been so obsessive with everybody else's, you know, style, you know, particularly like, you know, black, um, you know, uh, blues, blues and, yeah. and jazz. And, you know, so he he just like emulated that. So he, but he had a massive respect for it. So he, he'd look at it and he'd nail it on sometimes really crappy guitars and, and, and stuff like that. And then, so he just felt he was a culmination of it, everyone he was a fan of, right? But in that, he then carved out his own style, right? Yeah. And and then, you know, so all that um, copying and mimicking ended up becoming the reason why people are spray painting on balls, clapped in his God, yeah. you know? So so I think that, yeah, there's definitely an element for people to learn that, you know, you know putting the time in, investing a little bit extra in really seeing what makes other people successful and what makes other people themselves is a real quick, quick attract to understanding who you are as an artist. You know what I mean? That's it. Yeah. And I, I always think, cause you know, like I come up a bit more in the punk rock thing, which is very similar, that mentality of like, you don't have to have the skills. You, you just need to know a few chords and, and, and put some lyrics and, and, and express yourself, you know, but yep. I guess it gets to a point that you, you want to express yourself in a better way or, or, or in more different ways. So, um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, that's it. It's, it's, um, I sort of forget where I was going with that one, but it's, it's that thing of, um, yeah, like trying to do something original, but it's like, you've got to kind of learn what has already happened. Foundation. So you can, so you can know where to go and, and, you know, okay. and take all these little bits to, to push it together and create something sort of new. Um, so yeah, cool. That's that's I think that's that sort of stuff's lost a little bit. And I think like you said, it's it's this thing of no, I've got to I've got to be original, I've got to be real, it's got to be like all this stuff, but it's like it, you need to you need to learn what's happened first so you can best do that, you know? 100%, man. It's like it is there is an element of like you know, foundational like core, I'll say like values, there's core skills, there's core stuff that it doesn't matter who you look at you know they've all they've all um done that you know what i mean they've all gone through uh, all the people that like other mcs are looking up to they've done the legwork they've emulated they've copied they've looked they've read they've invested yeah. they've invested the time um you know they've invested the money and so as a result they're the best version of themselves 100 percent. yeah yeah 100 um so sticking back with your sort of young years, who do you, like what rapper do you think had the most influence sort of on your style and your approach? Not so much who who you sound like, but, or had an influence on your sound, but just who, who sort of, uh, who was the blueprint a little bit for you in terms of just like whole approach and. Uh, that's a tough question only because back, it is. back in, back in my day, um, I'd probably have to, the person that made me, I wouldn't say that really helped my approach, but the guy that made it easy was definitely Eminem. Like, like I can't, I can't dodge that, you know, that, yeah. um, that thing, because, you know, when I first started, man, it was still like a really, you know, um, you know, um, African American culture, you know, white boys were considered lame in it. Um, even, it's funny, man. I just had someone say on the on my Instagram last night, man. I was I was saying that um, you know, offspring were were saying pretty fly for a white guy, and, and you know, if you said to someone, "Oh, I rap," they'd be like, "Oh yeah, pretty fly for a white guy," and you're like, "No, I'm not some lame guy in some Fubu O five jersey," you know, like yeah. So, um, you know. But what Eminem did do was, I suppose, give credibility to you know the MCs that were white that were really um, were, that were really taking it serious. Do you know what I mean? And were invested and were were you know respectful but obsessive on the culture and the and the and the craft. So I think as far as um, lending to my ability to be considered credible, Eminem had a lot to do with it. Mm. As far as MCs that I probably 
you know, really looked to for, uh, you know, inspiration as far as, you know, content wise, how they carried themselves and their character and stuff, you know, like really loved Red Man. Yeah. Um, you know, I, my, my favorite MC um, of all time, as far as MCs goes, is Farrah Monch. Um, you know, I've organized confusion and, you know, he's gone on to have, um, a great career by himself, but the most deaths, the Talib qualities, those guys that sat content wise, probably not as deep into the African American culture. Uh, when I, and when I say that, I just mean, uh, I think that their content just wasn't as, uh, was, could be brought over to more, you know, where I could write, you know, creatively, yeah. do you know what I mean? It's big about my surroundings. So, you know, um, uh, I, I really lent on those guys as far as inspiration um, went, but it was really, it could only really be inspiration because I couldn't emulate them fully because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a white guy from Australia, you know what I mean? So yeah. one thing that I did take from the M stuff though was like, you know, um, one thing that I've sort of really, you know, grown to believe is like a lot of comedy comes through sort of pain through growth yeah. and stuff like that. And, and I found that, having a bit of a sort of cheeky spin to a lot of what I did. Um, you know, if you like, I listen back on it now, man, and to be honest, it's pretty cringe, but some of my old lines would just be, you know, me just saying something for a bit of shock value, you know, you know, what for whatever reason. Um, and, um, and yeah, I found that that grabbed the eyes as long as you're nice with the wordplay and stuff like that. Grabbed the eyes and ears of people that were watching, you know. So, so M did have a little bit of a, um, uh, I think, influence on that. Um, and then, yeah, that's um, that's pretty much it. But those guys, particularly, even Method Man a bit for, for his flows. Method and Red, um, Farron Munch, bit of M, you know, hundred percent. And then it just went. And then Dan, I just got got to a point where they, I love taking any inspiration from anywhere you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah cool that's a really yeah. interesting point you brought up about m because i guess for maybe some younger heads that you know between 15 or 20 checking this out they might not remember a time where it was that it was kind of white boy mcs were lame you know that the whole vanilla ice thing was you know that yeah. was the standard i guess and and it was all all that sort of stereotype and like you said like you made that point there m really brought that barrier down and, and and sure there was you know a million white MCs after that that were whatever signed and pushed that you know maybe shouldn't have been but it definitely made it more of a credible thing and and look probably the Australian scene in general because you know let's be honest when it first sort of kicked off and and was really happening was it was all white boys so right up. maybe that that this whole local scene doesn't doesn't kick like that without him so yeah that was i can tell you verbatim and it's no secret that you know sony were certainly inspired and i'm sure we'll touch on this in a bit but but the pitch from my manager was quite unashamedly this this young white guy from bankstown with tattoos right could potentially be the next m like australia's m and m do you know what i mean like so that's how it was pitched bro you know like it's not a it wasn't a secret you know like that's 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 it australia australia um australian music uh record labels you know they you know for them it's all about dollars and kickback and money right so you you got to just lean into the most successful thing you can relate to and and that was the only thing we had because i'm white and mind you I would literally be, I remember this specifically, like I remember being in Burwood and just like, you know, going up the escalator and some Lebanese dude that I've never met before, never, I don't know him, I, whatever. And he just turned around because I was a white guy with tattoos. He just goes, oh, m M&M. <laughs> Like, you know, like the stereotype is real, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I had a cheeky, I had a cheeky quip for him, but, you know, we'll leave that off. We'll leave that off camera, that one. <laughs> 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 but yeah, yeah look, but... look um yeah i used to get the dave Grohl thing when i was younger and i can tell oh. you stories about that that I, we'll, we'll talk about those later <laughs> um oh, you said cool. it. yeah yeah <laughs> um so yeah we will touch on you got you kind of brought it up there you segued into this one nicely so yeah around 2006 i think it was you were kind of you, you were pretty up there in the australian sort of mainstream 
industry, you had like major label support, which, you know, uh, oh, hang on. Someone's just, are we still going? Yeah, it says recording. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay, cool. Um, I just got a bit of a weird message. So, yeah, so around 2006, you were pretty pretty firm in the Australian mainstream industry, you had major label support. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, at that point, there probably wasn't many Australian urban or hip hop artists that had had any sort of major label support, maybe a few like, you know, 1200 techniques and um, I think it was Sound Unlimited a few years before that and and stuff. So it was a pretty big deal, I guess. Mm. Um, you, you got to work with some big names. You went overseas and, and obviously worked on that album and, and stuff like that. Um, and although you had a major label behind you, it was probably, you know, you probably weren't their, their biggest priority, but you still, I guess, had the weight of, you know, uh, you, you had a, a major label behind you, but you also had that pressure of then having that. So can you talk a little bit about like that whole experience in terms of like, you know, getting the deal with Sony and then and doing the first album and and, and just touch on that a bit? Yeah, man. Um, I'll try and keep it as, you know, because a lot to that part of my life, but I'll, I'll try and keep it as, I suppose, um, as, as quick as possible. So um, basically what happened was um, I was doing the rounds, just doing like freestyle stuff, whatever, um, and I was part of a crew, which is part partly in Brisbane, partly in Sydney, called Outfit. We met up with a um, manager that had an independent record label. Her name was Louie. And she actually, um, first of all, there was like eight or nine of us MCs. She was like a, it was like a Wu-Tang clan, right? Yeah. So she turned around and basically said to us, like, you know, like, this is too hard to push. You know, there's too many of you. The Australian market won't understand it, da 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 We were like, okay, cool. No harm, no foul. We'll, we'll just keep doing what we're doing. A little while later, she called me at work and she was like, hey, um, listen, I think that, uh, you know, you as far as skill-wise and and, start, and, and, and marketability, I, I could get you a deal, right? Um, would, is that something you'd be interested in? I said, absolutely, that's that's all I want to do, you know what I mean? Yeah. And she goes, okay, cool, well, 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 let's go. So I basically signed a deal with her as an independent label and I worked for two years to create what would be my first album, right? And this was with no financial backing or any backing from... Um, a major record label. We had a few labels interested, probably come get to about 12, 18 months, started having people coming through, listen to some demos, going, well, wow, you know, you guys are onto something essentially, but no real commitment from anyone. Right. And then just by chance, um, the head of Sony in the States, who was the head of Sony Global, happened to be in Australia, just doing a bit of a, a follow-up, a catch-up, um, and heard my demo in the house of Dennis Hanlon. His son was listening to it, Pat. And uh, he was sort of like, oh, what's your son listening to? And he was like, oh, it's someone we're thinking of signing. And he's like, well, we need to um, we need to sign that. Like, um, so what's the deal? Can we meet this kid? Ended up meeting Dave Massey um, at Sony head office. Um, and then they were like, do you have a, um, what do you call it? Um, do you have a uh, um, a show coming up, um, you know, or a show tonight by any chance? And we're like, yeah, we do actually. So, um, you know, we invited him down, we jumped out and we made sure that we just put out all the bells and whistles for that show. Luckily, we had been rehearsing and the stars really just happened to align. So all the homies came down to the show. My manager goes, here's 50 bucks, put credit in your phone, text all your, text all your friends. So I literally just got on the phone, texted everyone, free entry, cave, tonight, come down. She went, sorted it out, made sure we had a perfect sound system did the sound check, went and chilled, came back. And, um, yeah, bro, we just kicked a really well-oiled rehearsed show in front of a, a crowd of all my mates. And it just it just looked looked like a hectic night, you know. So yeah. Dave Massey just turned around to Sony and said, man, you got to sign him. Um, so in a very short period of time, I had a deal with Sony or or I we had a deal with Sony through the independent label. So I was signed to um, Under K9 and Under K9 signed the label deal with Sony. So that was that. Um, we already had the, the the album pretty much a single, I would say more specifically. And uh, so we went to the States. We were mixing and mastering it. During my recording process, Louis had actually made a created a relationship with Joel Martin, who's the guy that owns 8 Mile Style Publishing, who is Eminem's publisher, right? right? So she's got this relationship with Joel Martin. She actually forwarded him my music, Um 
because what had happened was um, she was like, I don't want Lee to sound like M because I had a bit of an easily delivery. So she goes, the best person to mix his vocals would be the guy that's mixing M and M's vocals. So she called Shady Music, uh, Shady After Aftermath, right? Yeah. Shady Records, and she literally just used that logic. And then um, she left a voice message. Joel Martin got wind of it and has known M since he was fourteen, and then called her back and said, "Hey, send me the demos. I'm interested to hear." He heard it and said, "Hey, can you just keep in touch with me? I just I'd like to see where you go with this. You know, down in Australia." So anyway, fast forward, um, you know, in LA, um, he, um, he basically linked us up with a lot of things, you know, linked us up with the mixing and the mastering with the girl who mixed the, you know, slim, um, uh, uh, Marshall Mathers LP, yeah. um, trade 2001. So this guy had Grammys in his house and stuff, you know, um, absolute legend, man. Shout out to the girl. Um, and we, we're over there for a couple of months. We came back, still didn't have the single, even though we were trying to do it. On our first trip, we'd met Red Fu, but we'd met him through um, another producer. So Red Fu didn't pitch us anything on the first trip because he didn't want to cut his mate's grass sort of thing. Right. So when we went back there the second time for mastering, um, we bumped into Red Fu um, and he was like, hey, I, you know, I didn't want to pitch it to you the first time, but I've actually got this beat for you. And that was the deal. I got an OB. Um, right. The visitation prior as well we had met tech nine exchanged numbers he came down to the studio he was really feeling the album as well so we sort of had his number in the pocket sort of thing so when we went back we got this beat off red foo we turned around and we said well let's hit up tech and get him on the single so that was it man with you know all lined up and then we released it um and very very quickly so when we actually got signed to sony the a and r that was trying to sign us was a guy called michael taylor and Michael Taylor really understood his release plans. He really understood about like getting the public ready for stuff, you know, like building it up, you know, peaking your single and then like trickling it off and rolling into the next album. By the time we had signed with Sony, uh, Michael Taylor, because of all the good work that he had done with like Selwyn, Delta Goodrum, blah, 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 um, he had gotten um, promoted to, I think it was Epic over in the States. Right. So we got a new guy who has unfortunately passed uh, since, but JD Springbet was our ANR and he actually didn't have ANR experience, not in, even in the Australian market. He was the old manager for Big Brothers, which was like a rap, um, which was a rap um, crew, like UK rap crew, right? Yeah. So, so that was that. He's come over and and he basically flipped our whole release plan. So he rather than do the the main single third or second, he just goes, "No, nah, we're going to go main single first. And you know, because nobody like nationally had really known me other than the heads in Sydney and the odd person in you know Brisbane, like I, I seemingly came out of nowhere. Yeah, you know. So um, it was it was. It was absolutely like killer to have like all this money and bro, like my posters were up, you know, on the walls, you know, um, I was in magazines, I was on, in the newspaper, I was on the TV, you know, I was everywhere. Like my PR was on point. And so even still to this day, people have vivid memories of like, oh, I remember when like Feed Kid came out, man, like that's a big deal to me because I was up at you know, Rage at three o'clock in the morning and, this guy from my area is on the TV with Tech Nine, like mind blowing, right? So, yeah. oh, I think I've lost you. You there? Um, but then, obviously, it's like the stars to align when I first got signed, just absolutely got railroaded by essentially all these other, like, sort of factors that really made um, driving it. Hard, and when I say that, I don't mean from a business lens. At the end of the day, like pushing the product, pushing the product, but it was really hard for me as an individual because all of a sudden I'd have people talking crap online, and then I'd see them, they'd be shaking my hand face to face, and that's not how I grew up. Yeah. You know that, you know? like you got a problem, you got a problem. So like, so I I found it really difficult to um, get my head around it. Fast forward, um, and what happened was. Um, because we had a really good solicitor through the independent label, 
they had negotiated that basically if the first album doesn't work, we can agree to get out of it, right? So so we managed to do that quite easily and that was great. The best part was we had all, all this momentum from Sony. So my manager went and hit, hooked up an awesome distribution deal with MGM, had it all pre-sold into Sanity. So we had a, you know, I wrote the album, went in. I wasn't the happiest with the project because mentally I was a bit thrown from everything. Yeah. Um, so the project did feel a little bit rushed, but she had done the legwork as far as the business um, went. So, you know, we we got all this stuff ready to go. We had the music, we had the product, all that. We had a James Brown um, sample cleared. We had dilated people. So we backed it up well. We had proof on it, bro. You know, like we, we did all this hectic stuff. Um, but then by that stage, man, um, you know, I'd had my first, I'd had my daughter. And, and mentally, man, I just wasn't in it for the games anymore. You know, like yeah. I'd really, truly been burnt out by the criticism. I'd been burnt out by the by by, by the work, and um, I'd had to I'd had to get a job at that stage because with Sony I wasn't working. But this time I was working. So being a brand new dad working, music commitments, you know, like it was just a whirlwind, you know. So. I had to turn around and say to her, look, unfortunately, like, um, you know, I've got a dip, you know, I want to get off the label and all that. And then, man, because she's the homie and she's, you know, she's family first and not business first, she 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 gracefully let me go from the label. Um, and then, um, yeah, a couple of years later, man, I had to get on the rebuild. Um, and that was, that was a that was a tough time, you know. Um, I, I was pretty burnt by the fit kid thing, so I came back out as Lynn Monroe um, and I started it all again, the, you know, but just had a few legs and a couple extra doors this time there you go <laughs> yeah yeah that's it um yeah because i don't know i think we've we've maybe we've we've talked about this stuff a bit but i don't i don't know if um yeah it's it's sort of sort of public knowledge some of that stuff um but yeah like i, I do remember and I, as you sort of mentioned earlier we've we've got a relationship from growing up in the same area and playing ball and stuff together but i i still remember the day of seeing the fig kid album on a shelf in you know in sanity or something like that wherever i was that day and i i just my first response was to laugh like i was blown away that you know someone i knew had had a cd and i still got the cd somewhere here um i found it a few weeks back but um yeah and, and i do remember at the time it was it was kind of a big deal you were kind of popping up everywhere um i kind of feel like it's almost like the local industry wasn't ready for you then. Like if, if that, if that album come out now, I feel like it would be, and not to say it wasn't received well in, in certain pockets, but I, I just feel like it, the market here would be more accepting of it now than at the time. Yeah, man. And I, you know, I say to people, you know, the first guy I threw the doors got a cop of bullets. So, you know, like I feel like first guy to, to sort of go out on, on that bigger scale. Um, so so yeah, I mean, you know, but I also can't sit there and 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 just try and relive the golden days, you, you know, like it you know, it's just not it's just not the, my my story, you know. So um it was I'm so glad to have you know been able to put it out. And and I think yeah, like as far as as far as critics and people actually analyzing the album, you know, I got four out of five in Rolling Stone. Um, you know, it what, it, and it's so funny, man. I even have people that are in the hip hop industry today that I respected people that threw me under the bus before, actually turn around to my face and say, you know what, we we actually, you know, we, we never weren't rooting for you, and I'm like, and like. And it's tough to hear that more because I'm like, I really needed those guys to back me in then and I, and I never yeah. did ha have that, you know. But now they come down to my shows and it's all love and I'm like, you know, I go, well, that's a tough pill to swallow, you know, because ultimately had I have had that support earlier, I might have been in a different, you know, position. And... Yeah. yeah so... Is what it is. I, I got it to roll with the punches, I guess. You know, um, that's it. But but also, like you and probably everyone else in the scene, possibly could have been in a better position if there was a bit more sort of support and instead of the the classic Aussie thing, I guess sometimes too, it's the tall poppy thing. As soon as someone gets a leg up, you know, you got, you got to kind of bring them back down to earth. There's 
that that happens a lot around here. But um, yeah, I guess it is what it is, isn't it? Yeah, man. I've got to, yeah, like I said, just got to, just got to roll with it. The, the tall poppy thing definitely is a, a real thing. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that much. But all I can do now is change that. So, um, you know, now I consider myself as a leader. I'm in the position that they, they would have been in then. And I do everything I can to try and help the next kid get up. You know, my knowledge is free. Um, out for people to be able to take advantage of, you know, because, you know, man, we, and I'm saying, I'm sure even in the punk scene, you know, similarly so, like, I don't want to turn around and act like it was only the hip hop scene, you know, I feel as though it went across a couple of scenes. Yeah. In terms of, in terms of what that sort of, that competitive tall poppy. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Like I, I, yeah, like playing, you know, punk rock shows and and metal stuff. Like it wasn't wasn't the most supportive scene. And I guess for me, I always played in groups that were a little left of center of the the genre we fell under. So we weren't always a pure metal band or a pure whatever. So we always kind of cop that that bit of slack. And then then even later on down the line, when I was sort of playing in hip hop groups. With Empire, we had a live band, so we still cop slack of of that. You know, we were we weren't a DJ. You know, we didn't have a DJ, and that was probably the biggest thing that people were like. You're not hip hop. You don't have a DJ, and it's like, whatever. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> yeah, shut up. <laughs> we've got a DJ. We've got a band. We don't need a exactly. DJ. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, but just talking, yeah, like so. It, it, like you did talk a little bit then you mentioned like you, you sort of you step back from it all and, and and family come a bit more of a priority but then you did sort of pop back up um a few years later and and you, you sort of popped up doing stuff with eloc doing the the overtime mixtape and and sort of doing the duo group thing what were some of the advantages in to working as a group other than a solo artist, and and I guess a little extra on that, was it easier to sort of try to get that leg back in and 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 just get that flow of doing it again as a group, other than a solo artist? Yeah, man. So basically, I tried to come out by myself first of all, but my connections I hadn't been out for two years, so I had my old connections. I didn't have new people, you know what I mean, and stuff like that. And so I did one or two tracks with. The- Producer who happened to live next door, which was dope. That was um, a nice little advantage there. Um, his name, um, what happened after that was um, I was on the internet and I came across Elo and he just had like a dope hip hop track. His flows are nice, bloody peeps of tracks. Um, and then, yeah. We basically turned around and said, well, what are you doing? Nothing. Well, what are you doing? Nothing. All right, well, let's just put out a do it like a duo. All our tracks is a duo. Um, so, you know, LMXCC or Limon LFC was sort of born off that. And um, it was a lot easier, man, because we got to share a little bit of the load. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he'd promo on his end. I'd promo on my end. If I had a good connection for a show, I'd reach out and say, hey, man, Put, put us on the show they'd be like well for you no worries you know so next thing you know he got a bit of shine because he was able to get in front of some people he might not have been able to before on the flip side simultaneously i've got to meet a lot of you know really cool producers and he's got a really good ear for things and you know so and because i was the face-to-face guy and i had the face-to-face relationships ella was really good at forging relationships online you know which which is something that i was sort of yet to really build on so you know, collectively, yeah, man, it made it a lot easier. We we're able to draw in a lot more um, resources and and get things done really quickly. Um, and it's a lot easier when you know you go to write a track and you've only got to write half of it. You know, like yeah, that's it. That's a massive advantage. So um, so yeah, man, we pumped it along for a good five years, um, and we had a lot of opportunity. It mm. did as 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 a few things doing in um, music. It did fizzle out to be honest and we got on each other's nerves in the end but we control we were we were a little bit stretched as, a, as a duo. um and 
and um, our basically um, our second proper full album um, we worked at for a year and it came out. So we had to work on our third album for a full other year. Um, so it's a lot of work for very little being said. Um, you know, fast forward, um, I went through a bit of a rough part in my life. And I know you and I have spoken about that, but on the other end of that, I was able to come out and it sort of get um, you know, built myself back up to I suppose where I'm at now, which is, you know, I'm pretty stoked with. Yeah. Yeah, I guess like uh, uh, you. Yeah. Uh, hang on, I think I've lost you a bit. Sorry, man. I think I got a bit of a bad connection today. Um, but yeah, there was a, a bit of a, yeah. I, I sort of asked that question, I guess, is because that's something I I say to a lot of the young guys coming through the studio and and our music programs is you know. Um, you know, get a bit of a group together, share your resources, work together. Um, you know, three heads are better than one in terms of, like you said, then trying to promote or trying to use contacts. Um, even like you said, finishing a track, like I guess for a younger guy coming up, I look at it as like put all your all your skill, energy and and, and whatever into that, that one verse or that hook that you're contributing for that project. Um, I, I think it's a good way to sort of, you know, to, to, to learn and do it without sort of having to be, you know, at all on you. And then, and I think going back to what you said before, it's not, you're not this single solo target then too. Like you can kind of, you haven't got all the shine on you, which can be a good thing sometimes, you know, like uh, it, it's, it, it's not always great to be center of attention, um, which might be a surprise to a lot of MCs to hear that. Um because yeah. I know they love being the center of attention, but um, yeah, I just I, I just feel like yeah. that's the, and, and, and totally. for, and, yeah, I was going to say um, just to back that in, you know, just recently I had a um, I was talking to a dude um, who was like, you know, he hasn't done anything and he wants to come out, um, but. Uh, when I started to go down the list of things that he has to probably take into consideration, um, all of a sudden, you know, he had just had his hands in his head, you know, or his head in his hands going like, oh, bro, I didn't realise it was that much. And I'm like, yeah, man. And like, um, you know, it's, it's we probably make it look easier than it is because we've been doing it for so long. So stuff for us is, you know, information that we've got over the course of X amount of years. So we are able to, sort of top and tail a project or a release of the thought process a lot easier because the compartment's already in our head of like what's to be done next. Um, but with that comes training. And, and the, funnily enough, the guy was a boxer and I said, it's like, you know, cause he actually had this thing where he said, well, why don't I, I, I can just buy a, a um, verse from Hooligan Hess and chuck it on there. Right. I told him it might be a couple of grand. He's like, yeah, well, that's all right. Okay, cool. But let me ask you this. Like if you're a boxer, do you, you know, think that you can just jump in and win a, a title fight by looking at the the guy that's on top of the mountain and going, I'll just get his trainer and then I'll fight him and then I should win, you know, straight away. It's like, nah, you've got to put legwork in. You've got to, there's a lot of conditioning. There's a lot of stuff that you've got to do before you get there. So sh sharing that load with a, with a couple of people certainly can, can be, um, you know, worthwhile, man, because yeah, it's just like a soft approach to getting yourself into the industry, you know? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll try to push on a little bit because I don't want to keep you here too long. We've been, we've been going for nearly an hour. Um, oh, yeah. okay. So, so it, like today there's a lot of, I, I feel like there's a lot of advantages for young artists coming up and, and even established artists, like in terms of like, you've got this, you've got the internet, you've got kind of, you know, these avenues to promote yourself and to even, like, even just recording your own music is a lot more achievable now in terms of budget and, and equipment and and then distributing through the internet and all these things. Obviously, you still got to do a lot of legwork and and work to, to make it do something, but there's a lot of these sort of opportunities and avenues 
for, for young artists and and, and stuff and, and even established artists. But do you think there's any sort of negative? Like, what's the negative of you that you see now? I guess compared to say when when you were coming up. Like, there's plenty of advantages now, but what are some of the the shitty parts? I guess. Uh, the disadvantage is certainly, uh, you know, and I'm sure, you know, I'm pretty sure we've had this discussion before as well, but um, back then um, you really had to be dedicated to it. And like, so the guys that didn't really want to do it get flushed out really quick. You know what I mean? So to be sort of top of the totem, you had to work quite hard and, you know, you um, you had to really be about it to, to be involved, you know. Whereas now, um, you know, any Tom, Dick and Harry with a half decent microphone and a laptop, you know, can put something on Spotify. And I think that, um, you know, in that regard, I think it does devalue, I suppose, the creativity of it um, to a degree and it, and it bastardizes it um, a little bit. Um that being said, look, I, I, do, I do still believe that, you know, if you're about it enough and your content is, is you know, authentic enough, you know, there's still space, I think, for those artists, certainly. Um, we do have to, I think, be mindful of them having to navigate through, through I think, the mental aspect of it because it is really tough to see someone that you might think is shithouse, you know, get props, you know, mm-hmm. Um and, and, you know, like, especially if you've put in a lot of yards and you've surrounded yourself with good people and you've, and you've got good music, you know, um, it's hard to watch something that might be a bloody meme of a track, you know, blow up and you're sitting there, you know. So I think that the education now for, for younger guys is really understanding that, you know, Spotify streams isn't the be all and end all, um, you know, um, getting the clout is not necessarily going to get you paid from making music if that's what you're here to do. How much do you love it? You know, and and also, um, you know, making sure that, you know, mentally you're preparing yourself for, you know, being disappointed, you know, like your track might only get a couple of hundred plays, mate. You might never see the light of day. It's, mm. you know, it's, it's how you stand back up a, from a, from a fall, you know, like that or like a shot like that to the mental. Um, so, you know, I think that although those shitty parts do exist, I don't think, you know, I think that if we play smart, we can still, you know, be involved. And I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the same boat as a lot of guys, you know, myself, and I'm still a, you know, recording artist. I still... I'm a professional. I still get paid for it. I still get grants from the government for it. I still, you know what I mean, do, you know, music related work with, with many people. Um, and it's, and it's another stream of income for me, you know, so I do consider myself still a professional recording artist. That being said, I'm not hooligan F's, you know what I mean? So yeah. I've got to be okay with that. And, and, yeah. and, and that is fine, you know? Um, so, so yeah, although the, yeah, I think that that's probably the biggest disadvantage is that it is almost too accessible these days to the wrong people. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, just knowing that talent is subjective, quality is subjective. If you push hard enough, you'll find your people out there to be listening to your stuff, you know? Yeah, true. Very true. Um, so yeah, you released, a. uh, EP earlier this year, Untitled. Um, can yep. you talk just a little bit about that, how that come about? What was the motivation to sort of to do the project? And 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 I know you released a lot of it as sort of singles first and then kind of released it as an EP with some extra tracks and stuff like that. So, yeah, just, just touch on that a little bit if you can. Yeah, so I didn't hear part of it, but, yeah, I, I think I've got, pretty much what you wanted to say yeah but have you got me here while i answer it yeah 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 all right hectic um so yeah i did release it and i'll I'll give a little bit of a tip with regards to the singles sort of thing before it um i so i was doing singles initially but i wasn't really um after I'd stepped away from the Lee Monroe LOC thing and I, I I wasn't really getting a consistent style. I think I was just like, you know, I'm re- relatively diverse as when it comes to, you know, rap. So I can do like a, you know, sort of R&B-ish, more like chill version. I can do a harder version of, of you know, I can do, you know, do a whatever, you know. So I can, I'm doing all these different styles 
And I had stuff to say, but I, I don't I don't think there was really much of a cohesiveness in some of the work that I was doing. So fast forward and, um, you know, I started to really, I think, land on my style a little bit as far as, um, as an artist goes. And there started to be a little bit more of a cohesiveness with the people I was working with, the content and the, the, you know, the, the caliber of the track. So I got to eight tracks I was happy with or seven actually. And I reached out to LOC to chuck one that we needed to get on there on there um, because it's a fan favorite that we never actually released. It was only right. it was only just a, um, a track that we ever only ever performed, right? So I go, okay, we'll chuck that on there as well. But you know, fast forward, and um, you know, I did release two singles off it. Um, the reason being, a first to get a bit of traction, but b another thing is is when when you release two singles off a project, they actually contribute to the album's um, streams. So if I get say well, I did. I got about eighteen thousand streams off the two tracks before the album. So, as soon as the album dropped, it looked like it had basically twenty thousand streams, which it didn't. It's just that those included singles, you know, were were linked to that album. Right. So that's um always a good, good little tip for guys coming up if they've got something that's popped really well. Um, it's a good idea. You know, as far as a single goes, it's a good idea to put that single on their EP because it will contribute to their EP streams. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I put it out as the eight track. Um, and, yeah, man, it was really well received. I was really stoked with it. Um, you know, made sure I got the right artwork and all that sort of stuff. But, um, you know, and another tip for the young guys, I did actually do – I've got one here actually. I did do a CD, um, which was good because, you know, people – know that they can have a physical copy of something from you you know i didn't go too ham with the casing or anything like that um i got it all this did cost me um 400 bucks for 100 of them which isn't too uh but because i had the opportunity to i chucked and eight extra tracks on there so that you know um somebody that was invested in me like that um you know got a few extra extra things for their money um and that was really well received as well and and the funny thing is man like i haven't even sold all these yet um, I've only sold half of them um, or just over and, um, you know, but I've got the equivalent of, you know, $500,000, uh, 500,000 streams, you know, worth from Spotify. I've got the same amount yeah. from selling, you know, hand to hand CDs, you know, which is, which is a couple of grand. So, you know, I think that that's probably something that's a little bit, as far as these new guys, the, the up and coming guys, they probably don't take this in consideration just because I know 400 bucks is a, is a bit of money to put up straight away, but to make that money back and then some, um, you know, if you can manage to invest in yourself in that way, um, you know, the 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 payoff does does come back. So, and that and that dropped in COVID, so that was a nice nice little bump of of, of money there too, you know, and a stream of and it just lends to that other stream of income. And I don't have the clout, you know what I mean? But some of the guys that have the clout, I'm probably making more money than, and that's fact. Yeah. You know, so smoke and mirrors, you know. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I, and I definitely think having that physical product, if you're regularly playing shows, um, you know, the, you, people, if the people are digging your stuff, they're going to drop 10, 20 bucks pretty quick. Um, where relying on them later to go stream your stuff or download your stuff somewhere else, you know, might not happen. Um, but And I do think there's a bit of a I, – I am noticing with – with younger listeners, like CDs and records are becoming a thing again. I think the the novelty of having this physical product is a new thing to some younger listeners. They've grown up with streams and stuff. So um, it, without getting into it too much, for me, I love it because I feel like that's part of the experience is, you know, getting that album cover and, and, and having that in front of you while you're listening, reading some of the credits, as you were sort of saying before. So, um, and then, like you said, it's that, it's just that, another revenue stream isn't it to just be getting a little bit of money behind you um so yeah so you did that yeah, totally man. independent that was just you there was no label or, or backing behind it no man totally independent well look i'm wearing my jumper how's that for some promo <laughs> so speaking of which <laughs> i started my own thing called true wealth um 
And and so you'll see that insignia and that branding and a lot of what I do now. Um, because you know, I, I got a little bit sick of of you know, um, I suppose people doing things for the wrong wrong reasons. Uh, so true wealth is you know wealth of mind and wealth of heart. You know what I mean? And and, and sort of thing. You know, knowledge yourself is is sort of like the it's sort of like the the slogan. So um, so yeah, man, I, I just. I started doing it, doing it all myself, um, and being in control, you know, and, um, it's been fantastic. Like I would recommend it and, you know, um, it, it's not as hard as people think if they've got a little bit of discipline to keep themselves accountable to just following a few things up a week, um, man, you can, you can, you'd be surprised with how much damage you can do and, you know, how much money you can make and how much you can be in control of your own, you know, uh, money as far as music goes. Um, and, you know, funnily enough, I've had artists, I had artists actually most specifically recently come to me who's got millions of Spotify streams, who's really reputable, was in all those cloud circles and and he came to me and needed help because, you know, his money and his, and his business wasn't straight, you know, and it hasn't been for a while. Um, and so, you know, I was able to have a great conversation with him to put him back in control of what he does, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and and now you know to be able to empower an artist like that, I mean, you know, that's good karma, man. Like you know, like you know, you you put that time into, into people, and you know that'll get reciprocated one way or another. Um, you know, in shit that you do. So, yeah, I, I, I believe in that. Yeah, and definitely, I guess in you know the industry, there's you know there's a lot of good people, but there's a lot of, I guess, a lot of snakes too. There's a lot of people that. Are, that are quite happy to watch you fall on your face or, or, you know, um, you know, step on your head to, to get a little leg up sort of thing. So, um, that good karma is always good. Um, well, just, just quickly, like with that album and in general, and I know there's no sort of set process in, in writing, writing or putting something together, but, Walk me through just a little bit, I guess, of of how you sort of approach a track, or or, or maybe even one of the tracks on the on the EP. Like, yeah, what sort of what's a bit of a creative process for you? Do you, do you get the beat first, or do you sort of do you get a lyric going first, and then try to find something to sort of get that on, or how does that work for you? So the process, um, you know, for myself, I I, I always generally because I write stuff about, you know, um, things that I've gone through or whatever, I'll get the beat first. Um, I've done a couple of sessions where I've worked with a producer through a beat. And, um, those, though, because for myself, I like to write stuff pretty, pretty. if I feel it, I, I like to write straight away. And sometimes it's hard in a, in a producer setting where they're creating the beat and they're chopping and changing and taking sounds out and putting sounds in. Um, that sort of stunts my process for writing. So generally what I'll do, there's two ways. Either I'll find a beat online, grab all the stems, and I'll and I'll write it to that and record it. Alternatively, I'll also um, write a track to something I've found online, and then I'll get it reproduced. So I'll send it to a producer to essentially get the same sort of vibe. It doesn't have to be identical, but, you know, it can get the same vibe, similar sort of sounds. Um and then yeah, man. So that's um that's my process as far as you know creating the 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 track goes. I, I me personally because I've been doing it for a while, I write pretty quick. I'm a bit of a believer in in getting the moment recorded. Yeah. So you know I'm not like a much of a chopping change and perfect and rework and rework and rework sort of guy. If I can get a pretty good take, then I'm that I'm happy with, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with that. I don't, you know, I don't sleep on it. And I think that that's probably a bit of a, an advantage that I have because some MCs probably over perfect the craft. Um, and unfortunately it either gets the, some of the emotion gets washed out of it, um, or performance or, or sort of rawness gets washed out of it. Um, and then the, on, on the other hand, sometimes people try to overwork it too much that they lose any inspiration for it. And then the, track never sees a light of day and sometimes they can be amazing tracks and i've heard i've got friends who are amazing artists that have amazing tracks that are, will, will never see the light of day unfortunately you know so I've, I've sort of 
learn to put stuff out. Um, as far as like putting an EP out, this is the first like EP I've put out um, as an independent artist. And the, that process for me, um, you know, went over a course of a couple of months. I sort of started to, as I got confident that a couple of tracks could be on the same project, I, I then looked to build some extra tracks for a project. Um, and then, you know, I had to just put my foot down and say, okay, this is the end. That's, you know, this is the artwork. This is the date that it's going to, you know, you know, um, come up. And so, you know, that, that, um, that process is really a bit of a box ticking and it, that can be the, the part I think that people won't be massively inspired to do. Um, but, but it's essential, I think, to getting it out, um, and, you know, getting it in people's ears. So, um, so yeah, man, so that's, that's the process. Um, you know, the only bad thing I think for me is I'm not good with the after marketing. So, you know, I can't sit with one project and have it sitting there and, and, and continue to release singles off it. Once the EP is done and it's out, you know, I've already got a track on the way with um, Lucky T. I've released a couple of little SoundCloud things. Uh, I'm working on a project with Prolific, um, which is a, just a little four track, um, you know, mini EP. And then I've got another uh, project coming out with a, a guy called Coloured Noise. So, man, I've got all these demos in my computer and it's ready to go for another, at least, I've got at least another two project releases coming out. So, Looking forward to those, man. Cool. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a thing with artists. I don't think we're always the best at, um, you know, the promotion side. Once it's done, it's on to the next thing, isn't it? Pretty quick. Um, but yeah, okay. you, mentioned, you mentioned then you, that you've got like so you've got a you've got a few producers and and stuff that you kind of you hit up for stuff and work with regularly. Um, is, is that the same for like engineers and studio spaces? Like, do you have sort of set places you go to record projects because you got that relationship or you just anywhere that's available and, and sort of in budget? Look, um, to be honest, COVID forced my hand a little bit and I, I was probably a bit of a late, I, I've always considered myself a bit of a la lazy guy because I'm sort of so pressed with the business, with, with, you know, work and, you know, everything. I sort of never really taught myself how to, how to track myself yeah. um so when covid hit last year i i just i bit the bullet man and i started writing demos at home and i thought you know what like i, I can't keep going to studios and just wasting time writing i've got to start getting proactive so i actually initially i bought just like a little podcast mic from jb hi-fi um which is pretty cool came with a little boom stand everything you know what i mean it was it was good i was getting decent um levels and stuff from it and then um this COVID, this lockdown, I, I, I said, nah, man, like, you know, I'm going to take it a bit more serious. So I, I grabbed, a, I grabbed a, a Rode NT1 with a little um, desk stand. Um, you know, I um, bought myself a light so I can do some promo stuff. I started using my, my little GoPro for like vids and, and things like that as well. Um, and, I, and I started to find it was so much easier for me to track myself here, just get a good level, you know, um, and then I was able to send just raw raw stems across to my engineer and just get everything done from the comfort of my own home, man. And now it's actually to a point where people are like far out, man, like you're getting a lot done. Um, and it's yeah. just because I, I, I've invested in having something at home, um, you know, and I'm, I'm doing everything on GarageBand, which is like the free program, obviously, I mean, you know, that comes with um, – with with your laptop you know so again it's not cheap but you know it's a it's a self-investment that will pay dividends you know in the future um so but prior to that i did used to have the odd space and engineer that i'd go to regularly um i, I work with the same mix master engineer esper um you know i like the sound that i get out of him um and yeah um as far as um, those go, I, I will say that um, those relationships are forged through, you know, respect, um, mutual respect and, and making sure that you're taking care of the relationship. I think that relationships are, are a massive part of, of anyone's success that I think a lot of people probably take for granted. Um, you know, 
burning bridges is, is should not be something that you even remotely want to be involved with because you know you never know who you're going to be talking to that could be a person that could help you in a way that will get you up considerably you know so i think you know just showing love and being respectful of all the all the professionals that you come across in any facet of the businesses you know for anywhere from cover work through the videos through the engineers you know the whole gamut yeah, definitely, mm. and, and I think that's that's a big one. And and the point I try to make to young guys that come across is like, you know, and and touching back, I guess, a little bit on what we were saying before. You know, like unlike a sport or or something else where you can kind of train and 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 if you're the best at something, you're probably getting the finances that come along with being the best at something. But I guess for music, like music you could be say considered the best mc or or like you're saying about clapton before clapton is god but he was still not re- reaping the financial benefits i guess of of sort of that you know being considered in that way but um and, and i always say to young guys like the relationships are, are, are big because you know you might be good but you might be getting booked based on the relationship you have with that person because you're easy to deal with. You turn up on time. You don't have a, a whole, you know, crew with you that's causing drama or, you know, like in the venue or anything like that. I, I think that's a massive part on it that, that people sort of miss a bit. And then particularly in, in the recording setting for someone who's quite behind the desk a lot um, and, and is a youth worker, I've learned that they're, they're very similar skills and, and it's a very, you know, an artist coming into a, an environment like a studio, especially for the first time, can be really daunting and, like, your music such a personal thing and, and you love it so much and it's it's your baby. So, like, entrusting that in someone is a big thing and, and often relationships develop quite quickly um, in a studio setting because you're kind of in this intense, vulnerable space um, so like I've got engineers that, you know, I worked with or, or, or whatever, and we developed a really strong, close relationship that's carried over for years. Like I haven't seen some of these guys for years now, but I still, I still consider them quite highly and, and, um, have a lot of respect for them because, because of, of them time spent together. And, uh, and I think that's lost a little bit today, you know, your relationships and, 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 you know, they're important to put the time into, you know, for your art sort of thing. Um, Straight up, yeah. That's that's a, that's something. Um, I feel, yeah, you're definitely right. And and you know, to say to that, like the engineer part, the even like the show part, rocking up late and stuff like that. Like sometimes artists get so, I, I suppose, full of themselves as being the performer that they forget every other person that is involved in making them sound sick. You know, like there is someone that's tweaking your microphone levels to make sure there's no feedback, you know, from your monitors and, and, you know, making sure that you sound and really like in a sweet spot, you know, on the microphone, you know, there's people that make sure the lighting looks good. You know, there's people at the door making sure that people come in, you know what I mean? And, and, and have a good time. You know, there's people, there's bar staff, you know, yeah. um, in the studio. Yeah, definitely. There's, you know, the engineer, you know, um, there's the producer, if the producer isn't the engineer, you know, um, and, and they're all there to really for you just to slap your sticker on the front and then say, I'm the best. Man, like, you know, it's, it doesn't matter even if you are a solo artist, right? You, you know, it's still part of a team effort. And I think that yeah. just showing showing some respect and um, a, a little courtesy to, to an acknowledgement of what they've done for you um, goes, a bit, goes a big way. Like, for example, like, um, you know, there's a guy that um, I've known for years. His name's Jeff. I've known him since the Fig Kid days. And, and to this day, he does some incredible work for me for uh, photo shoots, um, filming. Um, you know, he did this, he, he did this logo, which is a, which is like slick, man. Like that's corporate sort mm. of style slash, you know, so stuff like that. Um, you know, if it wasn't for someone like him in my corner and have been over, over the years and years and years, like I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have half the stuff that I have out you know, today. So, you know, it's, it's about paying respect to those people without doubt. Cool, man. Well, we'll, we'll wrap up, but is there any, any sort of one, one piece of advice you could give young MCs coming up? I know we've just given them a heap, so, you know, they can deal with that. Yeah. Man, um, 
Nah, you know, like it's just, um, I think, um, you know, if you're going to take it serious, you know, go the whole, like, you know, and, and be prepared, I suppose, for not being top of the top of the hill mountain straight away. You know, you've got to, you've got to work yourself up and, and there is actually a lot to take from the journey. You know, like I think that the journey is probably the thing, the journey is the thing you will regret not taking. If you if you just keep gunning for like a quick a quick fix, you will regret not going through the steps if you get to the mountain top of the mountain too quick. Because I mean, even from what I said today, you know, like I know I seemingly came out of nowhere as a big kid, right? But you know, maybe there was elements of a journey that I hadn't gone to yet, you know. And I did get a bit of a quick uh, quick run there, you know. And and don't get me wrong, I felt as though I did a couple of years for it, but I could have learned a lot more on the way as well. You know what I mean? I still could have been in a you know a few more trenches, got my hands dirty in a few more ways. And there's things that I'm learning today at like damn near 40, right, that I could have learned years ago and that, as that would have certainly helped me be, you know, bigger than what I am, you know. So, yeah. you know, I think there's yeah, beauty in the journey, man. You've got to make sure you make sure you take it. Don't take it for granted. Definitely. Definitely, yeah. I think I, I I've said very similar things. I think to to young people, like, um, you know, like I, I in my time of playing around, like never had any massive sort of commercial success. I think we got some airplay. We we did a lot of killer shows, and we and we did it all our way. Um, met good people along the, the way, um, and and that was success for me. So I always say to young people, like what's success for you like and and that's that's your bar you know like if it's about money whatever that's that's your thing but you know if it's about actually just your credibility and your and your sort of rep of of being you know a good songwriter a good mc sort of thing so what's your success you know and and figure out what what you're deeming as successful 100 percent Cool, man. Um, I'll get you to send me some links and stuff like that that I'll chuck up with the video. But so where's the best place for people to sort of to, to grab your music or check out your stuff or get in contact? Um, it's just um, you can go to leemonroe.com.au um, or just hit me up on Instagram, um, Lee Monroe, L-E-E-M-O-N-R-O. Um, and, yeah, those two spots are the main one. You know, you can all you, if you go to the website, you can buy a shirt. Cool, <laughs> everyone go do that. Go buy a shirt, man. I'm shopping, I'm doing online shopping like a friggin' demon since um lockdown. So I might go check out your website after this, mate. Mate, look at that. <laughs> look at that. Oh, that's you know that's, what, dope. that's dope, but yeah, man, I was so. St- so for the artwork, like when I do the CDs, I was doing bloody stickers. You get stickers with them and everything, like because um the that um and man, the best thing is, bro, that artist is is Miss Mez's cousin, bro. Who sorry? That guy that did that artwork. You know, Mr. Mez. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's his little cousin. So right. the guy that did my artwork, he actually did one of Drake, and Drake shared it. That's how good he is. Yeah, right. Wow. You know, so, you know, you know, for me, like I try to make sure that all the elements are, are sick in one way or another, you know, but, um, but yeah, so hectic. And yeah, man, I totally agree, bro. The online shopping has been atrocious. <laughs> but um, yeah, thanks for today, man. It's been good having you and um, good having a chat about some of this stuff and, and hopefully it's helpful to some, um, some of the young guys and, and other artists kicking around. Hundred man, I'll um I'll hit you up and I'll send you I'll send you a couple of links in the um in the uh, chat. Yeah, no worries, man. All right, enjoy your weekend, man, and we'll talk to you soon. Bro, thanks, Jay. For sure. Cheers, bro. Have a good one. See you, man. Please give me a yes. Cause Evans Gate got me feeling real nervous. Trying to be the best I can while I figure out my purpose. Hey yo, you gotta forgive me for my past and if.